Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am going to be up here for about 17 seconds. Ready? Time. Me. I get the pleasure of introducing to you that don't know him and just announcing for those of you that do a guest speaker today. We've talked to him for the last several weeks. Um, the McCormick family is with us. Stand up, McCormick family. Desmond already walked out. Yeah, yeah Desi already left. Actually, a year ago, last Sunday, was Kelly's last message in this church. So he's timing it perfectly. So uh, I am just going to turn it over to Kelly, let him share what's on his heart. Uh, don't forget, after service, we have Paul up out back. We get to spend some time fellowshipping with him. He's leaving. I'm not leaving. Okay, I said, let me see what I can whip up real quick. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, just actually get my Bible. It's, uh, sometimes I all together misplace. It's a little awkward sometimes. Um, all right. Wow. Well, good to be back. Uh, it, it odd to be introduced as a guest speaker at Jesus Community Church. Uh, after pastoring here for 21 full years. Uh, wow. It, it, ever since we left, I really look forward to this moment. You know, to, to be the returning... Uh, pastor, after having been here so long, you know, sort of pastor emeritus, you know, and, and uh, come back and be among uh, so many that are family and friends, and, uh, and to see the new faces that over the course of the year, uh, those of you that have come and, and uh, just joined and identified yourself as part of this body of the church, um, it's, uh, it's very good. Very good. I don't even really even know, hey Diane, I really don't know where to start, because uh, uh, the full year's gone by and uh, a lot has gone on, and uh, really we kind of now really return as, uh, you know, you guys set us off on a missionary journey, um, and we've gone and spent a year, uh, we're cycling back for a few days. Um, and then we'll be back at it again in that same mission field, in that that uh, that foreign country that we call Southern California. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously, be praying for Southern California. California is only really just getting worse every day. California legislature, the things of which they are mandating upon the state that are utterly uh, you know, unbiblical and immoral and, uh, and just uh, uh, troubling indeed. Uh, but a uh, great context into which to speak you know, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, they're mostly not a hungry people, you know, they're mostly a comfortable people. And uh, content and uh, living well and um, enjoying uh, the life they have there for the most part. Um, and so it's not an easy field at all uh, to go to a place where uh, people think they have everything they need and uh, uh, they obviously lack the one thing that they truly need. So uh, we've been called to that mission field and uh, um, we had, uh, let me, let me, I'm going to start basically, I'm going to kind of share where we're at right now, and then um, kind of uh, some background for those of you that don't remember or for those of you that are new here, and then in looking ahead um, and what I would really ask of you in that regard. So, first of all, where we are right now. You know, we, we left, June 25th was our last Sunday here, we left the valley June 9th, we got, uh, July 9th, we, we got to Carlsbad, North County, San Diego, um, July 11th, and just began to meet people in our neighborhood, and meet people uh, here and there and everywhere. Um, and then, as a fellow uh, pastor, some of you remember I speak of uh, Cliff Leslie, Pastor Leslie in the LA area that kind of was my main contact in Southern, Southern California. He knew that there was a, there was a church kind of in the area, two and a half hours away, um, that was really in need of, of, of just ministry and shepherding. And 
and teaching, and, and then I was kind of semi-available. And so we took on what really amounted to a part-time uh, interim pastorship there at uh, Calvary Bible Church in the Southern Valley, California, um, east of L.A. And, uh, and so for six full months, really, it took our attention and energy and time away from the ministry there in San Diego, more than I really kind of thought it would. Um, it really kind of all together sort of put it on hold for what turned out to be seven months. And, uh, and so we finished that just in April. And so in May, we really, in earnest, we have, we have really not begun uh, the, 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 the work in some tangible sense um, until May, just a short time ago. I think it was maybe the second Sunday in May. And, uh, and so that's, that's less than even two months along. We had just a few weeks before we left. Um, and some of you, I know that I've talked to Glenn. He's always been a little bit frustrated that I have, you know, they haven't got a lot of information from us. and a lot of Because basically week in and week out, it's the same thing. We're just meeting people, um, loving people, and sharing Christ with people. Um, and uh, but beginning now, there's really a sense of you know, things are coming together. Um, we meet uh, on Sunday evenings. Um, we have... Uh, two families that, have, that are joining with us. We've got, and, and again, this has just started up in May, and so it's just beginning traction. I've got a number of other families. There's a family that's making a vacation to the East Coast that said, my, my family and I really want to be there this Sunday, but we can't make it. And then, of course, now we're gone for the next three, starting today. Um, and then a couple of other families that have shown a great deal of interest, and we've met with them, and, and, and so forth. So I think really we're on the verge of of, of really establishing a house church. Um, the, uh, the one of the two families that have joined with us is one that's more than just somebody who's come. They see themselves as part of the core group of the church plan. They see themselves connected to it. It is their church. It is their ministry. And uh, that's vital. Uh, vital. That one key family. And, uh, and we have them. And they're awesome. Uh, they're, uh, they've got... Kids like we're pretty much not even Desmond's age, and a younger one, one of the children with a mild form of, of autism, um, and uh, they're in their late 30s, um, and fairly new believers, and growing, and with an incredible passion and desire to grow. We meet with them weekly at their house for discipleship and mentoring, and uh, just kind of planning and prayer and strategy and all that kind of thing, and then we meet at our home on Sunday night. And, and uh, so that's where we are right now, okay? Um, where it kind of came from, as briefly as I can put it, I hope, um, you know, the whole story goes back maybe 10 years where God said you're going to leave this beautiful, comfortable place and you're going to flee to the, you know, run to the city, run to the battle, run to where the people are. And then about two or three years ago, about three years ago now, it was two years before we left, um, you know, really God said you're going. And... Uh, and so, uh, you know, I announced to the church on February of 2012. I said, June 25th is my last Sunday here. And with tears in my eyes and many of yours, and, and uh, but it really is pretty awesome. And, I mean, mo most of you, I think, really do love me. And, 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 there, there might have been a few people celebrating, you know. Uh, but... Uh, uh, so right now in February, we're going, man, June 25th. We didn't have anywhere to go. We had nothing to go on. We hadn't sold anything. We had no money. Uh, but we're going, June 25th. And, uh, uh, and God really put us to a test of resolve because we had like a U-Haul order and still had nowhere to take it um, and nothing to, to go on. And, <laughs> and then... Uh, um, we, you know, we had like all this property for sale, we had a house for sale, we had a vehicle for sale, we had all this, you know, we had this land in Texas and stuff, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, within, I believe we actually even got into June before anything happened, and then uh, uh, we got a phone call from a realtor that said, uh, and this is after, folks, eight years we had property on for sale, eight years on a single offer. I get a phone call that says, hey, we got an offer on one of your pieces of property. Awesome. You know, because a chunk of money, right, sell a lot, that's just a big chunk. We can move on, we can get established, we can buy a lease, we can, you know, get there and get settled. 
And uh, so about an hour later, I got a phone call because they'd actually I had two realtors because one was part time because he's having to go to the oil fields in, in North Dakota to, to supplement his income. So then the other realtor calls me about an hour or two later and says, uh, you know, we've got a, an offer on your property. Said, yeah, I know, man, isn't that awesome? And I was telling him how it was so perfect in God's timing in our life because we're getting ready to leave. And, and, uh, and, and then maybe an hour or two later, I get another call saying, you know, those weren't even the same offer. You got two offers. <laughs> And uh, so it kind of drove the price up a little bit, and uh, and, and, and it's and it sold. Um, it financed our trip to leave. And then the second one sold not long after we got there. Again, eight years not an offer, and the guy said, boom. Our house hadn't sold, hadn't rented. I was just contacting a, a property management company to say, you know, we haven't sold, we're desperate. Uh, we need to rent the house to pay the mortgage. And, um, and, and even before we could get that contract signed to do that, our realtor, who's awesome, she comes and says, you know, I know you haven't wanted to rent it, but I know you're getting kind of crunch time, and I got somebody who'd like to rent it. And, uh, and one of the few high salaries in the area that really can afford to pay the top dollar on your big house. And, and, uh, and so uh, I think it was maybe a week or two before we left, we signed a kind of lease agreement, boom, he's in. Um, awesome, the house is taken care of for one full year. And and, uh, and then even an odd thing with one of our vehicles, we had this Dodge Durango for sale on Craigslist forever, and, and I'd always kept it the lowest price of all of them. And, and, and I think 18 months went by, you know, and the thing hadn't sold. And, and then about a week or two before we left, it was almost kind of like those times when Scripture says, you know, you'll entertain angels unaware, because this guy called me and says, you know, I saw your ad and I really like it, I want to buy it. And I said, great, you come over and look at it. So he comes over and looks at it. He never even touched it. He didn't even open the door. He didn't start it. He didn't drive it. He didn't do anything. He said um, he was, he moved from Costa Rica, that he was a, an author and a real estate agent. And I was a little curious about this guy. So I looked him up, and sure enough, I found all his two websites of his author and real estate thing in Costa Rica. He says, I'm here just for a time, and I need a vehicle. And so he, but he says, I'll have to get some money, you know, wired over from Costa Rica, a lot of that. And uh, so he comes, and he gives me, boom, you know, several thousand dollars cash. And, and he had, the first time he got in it was to try it away. So it was really kind of weird. And uh, so that was a blessing. So it, basically everything happened in those last two or three weeks and made the way to go. And one of the things is I want you to know that, and especially those of you that are new here today, because you need to be convinced to really be on board with us in this ministry, in this project, as really kind of a daughter, sister, church plant, of Jesus Community Church. You need to be certain as we are that Almighty God has called us there. Okay? And uh, so that's part of it, the financial picture that God moved. It was just easy for him. Uh, other things that made it so utterly certain is that at first it was like you're going to the city. Okay, where? You know, for some crazy reason, the first place in my mind's eyes I would pray uh, was um, New Boston. Uh, and then it was, you know, kind of drifted to the West Coast from Seattle to San Diego to, and then include Honolulu. And, uh, and remember, it actually reminds me of when God brought me here in 1991. I was just finishing seminary, and I would pray about places. And in my mind's eye, I first prayed about the Seattle metropolitan area. And then I began to pray for the state of Montana. Then I began to pray for western Montana. Then I began to pray for the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. So I, I went to school in the University of Montana, I knew it well. And I would pray for the cities and the towns and the unsaved people and so forth, the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. Three days later, I got a call from Butch Smith, one of the elders here at the time, from Stevensville, the heart of the Bitterit Valley. We want you to come and be our pastor. Or, you know, at least come visit and see if it works. And, you know, of course, 21 years later. So same sort of thing. Boston, West Coast. Then it became the great, the great coastal cities of California. And I know somebody said to me, the great coastal cities of, Cal of, of California, and, and uh, but yes, you know, the, the, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego, and for a time there, it really looked like, I thought God was calling us to, to San Francisco, to the Bay Area, um, but then it, it shifted, the focus was like a laser beam in San Diego County, and then I began to do demographic studies of where churches are, and where, uh, uh, 
you know, the, the all the, the you know the cults and the other faith systems were, were where there's a lack of, of Christian witness and teaching. And there was this this area that, that I just kind of did all this study and ended up with a bullseye on a map. And the bullseye of the map just kind of happened to lie in this northeast corner of one of the suburbs of, of San Diego in North County. It's called the town of Carlsbad. There's a northeast corner, and just north is Oceanside, and then just to the east is Vista. And, uh, and it was at the intersection of Carlsbad Village Drive and Tamarack Avenue. I put a mark there, and then I drew a six-mile radius, and there's 350,000 people in that six-mile radius. When you draw a six-mile radius around this church or my home, I think you get about 6,000 people. See more than that, I intend. Um, but 350,000 people inside here, and there was not there, there were not existing churches, you know, that were above ground surface, you know, you could find on a Google map or whatever. As well as there was a presence of Hindu and Buddha, and Buddhism and New Age, and different things, and just just a very secular, lost place. And so that was the bullseye. So I was talking to my son Abram, who now is. Uh, uh, you know, teaching high school math in Scotland uh, with his Scottish wife there in Scotland. Um, and he was just getting ready to go to Scotland to leave there and be there and marry her and stay there and live there. He said, Dad, well, for one thing, first, for, for a couple of years, I thought I, I was just going to kind of do it the easy way. <laughs> and sometimes, believe me, I'm so sitting there going how incredibly much easier it would be just, you know, Glenn... Praise God, you know. And same thing when God brought me here. Because I'm just thinking, to just fill a new, an open position in a thriving church and just slip in as the pastor would be so good. Because this is, what we're doing is so hard. Uh, and, uh, but we were looking, we thought that that's what it would be, you know. So I was looking at, you know, churches in the West Coast that, uh, you know, need a pastor. And then it was kind of like, all of a sudden, I was lying in bed one night, and it was, no, Kelly, it's like the new work, plant church. And so I went back to that demographic study, the whole deal, here we are, the ground zero, and just began to focus in and pray. And then Abram asked me one night, shortly before he, he moved to Scotland, he says, Dad, if you could plant a church anywhere on the planet, where would you go? And when it comes to doing a new work like that, you really are, the whole planet's open. I mean, why here, why there, right? It could be anywhere. We didn't have to be limited to, you know, Boston, San Diego, etc. But anyway, and I said without hesitation, I said Carlsbad, California. And not specifically just the town of Carlsbad, but the three cities of Carlsbad, Vista, and Oceanside. But that bullseye was in Northeast Carlsbad. So I said Carlsbad, California. The very next day, I get a call from Cliff Leslie, my contact there in Los Angeles, who I've been talking about, you know, the whole thing of filling positions, and he would know what's available, let me know. And he said, Kelly, I want to ask you something. Are you willing to do a church plan? And I said, I've been, my wife and I have been praying about it. I've been talking about it with my family. That was the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. I'm excited about it. Yes. And he said, well, there's a church out here in southeast L.A. that wants to do a church plant uh, on the beach. And I thought of you because he knows how the Kelly, the me, the, the man who loves the beach. And... And so it was on the beach, I thought of you. So I used to think, he's saying L.A. and beach. I'm thinking Long Beach or something, you know? And uh, later in the conversation, he says they specifically have a burden for Carlsbad. <laughs> Carlsbad. So I said, okay, God, we're done. Uh, uh, you know, I don't have to wonder anymore where we're going. We're going to Carlsbad. And uh, so I made a trip down there, and I visited the area, and we scouted it out, and I drove around the four corners of the area and prayed, and then I went to that ground zero intersection, Tamarack and Carlsbad Village Drive, and I prayed on the four corners. I'm looking out, it's all residential area. It's, it's, it's a really beautiful residential area, incredible landscaping, just gorgeous, and all you hear is birds chirping, believe it or not, it's true, it's Southern California, but it happened. And, and I came home and I told my wife, I said, wow, it's just a beautiful area. It's kind of like when you're scouting out the promised land, right? It's like, well, it's beautiful, but... No way we could afford to live there. And uh, so then, you know, that was a, a year before we moved, and so we do all this stuff and we're preparing to go. And, and then we finally all the stuff sold, right? And so now we've got money to, to find a place we could we could say we could, the place to take the U-Haul. And 
Uh, we looked, and different things happened, and long story short, um, we live 400 feet from ground zero. Um, and, uh, you know, God just opened the door, and, uh, it, it's, and it meets just what we wanted it to be, and that is, you know, in a dense neighborhood, you know, we went from a 3,800 square foot house on 10 acres to a 1,400 square foot condo that, we, that, that has seven other condos in the very same building. Okay. And has you know no lawn of its own, just a little deck out back, and, you know, among the eucalyptus trees and the birds and, the, and even hawks. We got three red-tailed hawks that frequent every day. We see them. It's a little reminder of Montana. We had hawks every day. Um, so we got to open that door, and there we were. So I share, I share all of that from how God moved financially to how God you know specifically showed us Carlsbad that brought us there, and even that, that one dot that originally was drawn only by you know, prayer and study, not knowing what it was going to look like when I went and just explored that intersection, and then we lived 400 feet away. So that's kind of first, you know, kind of where we're at right now, and then the background of what happened to get us there. Now, the present. I really come back to you, my sending church, my home body, Many of you, not many, but there are actually a handful of you that were here the first time I ever stepped foot in this building 22 years ago. Um, and many of you for a, a long period of time. And obviously it's a summer, it's a holiday weekend. You know, God has all that under control, but the fact that there's a number of folks here um, that we don't, that we would love to see, and we still have opportunity, obviously, to be here for a few days. But, um, I'm coming back to you as our home church, sending church, um, and really I have something to kind of repent of and, and impart to you. And that is when we left, we left far too independently of you. We had thought, because the other thing that came into the picture financially was, is that my great-grandfather, 130 years ago, bought some land in Texas. I don't know why, nobody ever lived there, he never lived there. He lived in Illinois, but he owned a section of land in Texas. Before anybody knew there was oil in Texas. And then they found oil in Texas. And then for a hundred years, nobody ever did anything with it. And many, those of you that were here when we left heard this, uh, this story as it unfolded. Because it was kind of like when God could do things, like even right now, you know, God can still, he can sell a house. He can, we still have a lot for sale. Um, he can sell our daughter's house that we own 25%. Uh, say hello to Jack, okay? I will, thank okay, you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then there's like this provision X. God can just do any crazy thing out of the blue, right? Well, this was, at that time that it came to be, that was provision X. It's like, are you serious? After all these years and generations, they're going to actually drill on that land? And that we actually began to receive royalty checks. And, and the, the, the potential was really mind-boggling as far as what could flow from that um, to where we would have, we would be beyond independently able to, to function and do ministry and the whole nine yards, okay? So we saw that and was like, oh, God, that is absolutely crazy. So based on all of that, we kind of really left here in a sense of we don't need to, to raise support as a missionary. Um, because we we have we have the resources. Well, and I guess no pun really intended. There. <laughs> well, the first well went dry, and the second well came in dry. And at this point, if they want to maintain ownership or lease, they have to do a third and fourth well over the period of the next couple of years. But they're not obligated to do so. So right now we're at the point where it's like zip nah. Okay? And uh, actually our first month that we didn't receive a check was a couple months ago. We got a little one recently from some residual stuff. There's always a possibility. There's also what I include in that prayer that God can sell our house, land, and house, and different things, is that he could he could shake the earth a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he can shake the earth a little bit 
<laughs> and he could take those dry holes, and they wouldn't even need to pump them out. You know the old-fashioned gushers he used to have? He could do that. I, I, it'd be a cinch for him to do that. Okay? But we don't know what his will and purposes are. All I know is that he called us out so far, and then said, okay, you came here on faith, and now we're seriously living by faith in a place in my adult life that I've never been. Married in a family, in a house, and playing, get this, guys. That house I described here in Montana. Rents for $200 a month less than we rent that 1,400 square foot of condo. Oh, oh so we got these two things. And, 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 and actually, honestly, one of the reasons why I think people don't go as missionary church planters to some of these areas, like San Francisco and San Diego, in really expensive areas to live, is because that, that's a burden, it's an obstacle, it's a difficulty. But when you think about it, you know, if God were to call me to Irian Jaya or, you know, to, to Dominican Republic or even like Sausalito in the Bay Area, you know, the most expensive place, one of the most expensive places on the planet. It really doesn't matter from a kingdom perspective. If he wants to provide for a missionary to be in Erie and Jaya, uh, and, and even it's is, is like the, 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 the kidders in Belize, living among the natives and just like them, which is all we're doing, right? And, uh, um, and he has a military pension, and, and man, they're set and they're good, and there's very little needed there. You can do that. But if he wants you to be in Sausalito or Carlsbad, it's a cinch. It's the same thing. It's just the provision is different. And, uh, and we know that. <coughs> We're really at a place right now that, like, in a couple of months, you know, because the renter's out, like, today or tomorrow, and we don't have it sold or rented. Um, we don't have really anything anymore. <laughs> but the few things that are for sale. Uh, which are big, it's, you know, it make a difference, but, um, in the earthquake in Texas, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, where was I going with that? Um, let me just get back to, that's where, well, yeah, it, we don't know what, what we're going to do in a couple of months, okay? Um, and, you know, I've never been homeless before. Uh, by choice I have, I guess. You know, when I was a young single guy, I was a vagabond for a bit. You know, I was having some fun. Um, but, uh, but that's where we're at. And so when I say what I repent of is that we, did, we left here too independent. And so we're back really doing what typically is done well ahead of time. And that is, we're kind of like the missionaries come back to the mission field, and we need a raise support. And you are our sending body, and, uh, and we lay it before you. Okay? Much of what I've said here is to do two things. To assure you of God's calling in our life to where we are, and the need that is there. And then secondly, the need we have. Now, let's turn into the scriptures together. Because what we want to do at this point is... To edify the body and all of us, church, about uh, our responsibility as believers to support the missionary cause. Okay? That would be us, it would be the kidders, it would be TJ right here in our midst. TJ, Van Day, stand, would you please? Woo! with the impoverished people in St. Croix as well as the not impoverished people in St. Croix. Um, and, uh, and he's kind of at a turning point, kind of a crossroads right now with what God wants him in, where, what he's to do and where he's to be in the whole nine yards, right? Cry out to God, give me a new vision, all right? Um, but whether, whomever we support and others will come, whatever, okay, this is what this whole thing is all about. Turn to Matthew 28. We'll go through a lot of this really quickly. Many of you will be familiar. Some of you will not. Uh, but laying the foundation, the classic passage, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is why we do what we do. I remember about two 
or three years ago, I challenged the brothers in the brothers' meeting. And I said, and this was really even before this whole thing started with God redoing the thing that you're going to the city. I laid out before the men and said, you know, I just want to begin to us visualize that some of us, God is going to call out to go somewhere. Kind of like, who's going to be the first? And, and be willing to be called out into some new and different thing for you, God to do crazy stuff with you. And then God gave me my thing. And I thought, well, I'll probably be the first. Well, you know, Mike and the kidders beat me to it. And, but that came out of, that seemingly kind of came out of nowhere, right? Well, obviously it didn't. God's working, moving in their lives and whatever. But it was this huge deal. They sold everything, packed it up, and went to Belize. They are doing so much the real deal, folks. Without so much of the trouble and overhead and crazy things and missions can involve. Uh, but so this is why we do it. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 22, the Great Commission. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the edge, the end of the age. So go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus, as Almighty God, pardon me, Died in our place because we deserve it. He rose again from the dead. He gives us new life. Uh, so go. You know, what I really like about this passage more than anything is where verse 20 says, I'm with you. Because 18 tells me he's got all authority. Awesome. 19 tells me go. But if that's all I got, I'm going, he's got the authority. He tells me to go. Yikes. But verse 20 says, I've got all authority, you go, and I'm with you. And so, uh, we're, we're going. Alright? Then, just over a bit to Acts, after all the Gospels, in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. <clears throat> really, the Matthew 28 is what? You know, go. The Great Commission. Acts 1.8 is kind of like the hat. Uh, and he tells us early in this whole witness of the early disciples, says there in verse 8, You know, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Now, you realize, you know, you jump ahead to chapter 2, and we have Pentecost, and we have people speaking known languages of people gathered around them. They say, we hear in all of our own native languages, what do they hear? Mighty deeds of God. 1-8, you'll be my witnesses. You'll you receive power and be my witnesses. Chapter 2, they receive the Holy Spirit and they become His witnesses. Boom, purpose fulfilled. Speaking and declaring the mighty deeds of God. But notice also here in 1 8 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, does that mean we need to go to those three places? No. These, this, for them, you know, everybody's got their Jerusalem, etc. Your Jerusalem is this valley. Okay? I think it's a little bit bigger than just each of the little townships because we represent more than one township here anyway. It's like this valley is your Jerusalem. Judea represents um, your region. Okay? Which might be, you know, political boundary thing would be the state of Montana. That's a bit big and diverse. It might really be like western Montana. Okay? Your region. Okay? Um, so your hometown, your home region, Samaria is your nearby cross-cultural people. So for us in California, that's easy. You know, that's the, 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 the Hispanic community, primarily. They, they, they have a different culture, a different language, but they're nearby, they're right there. And Mexico is only like 40 miles south of uh, we live right south of the border here, and now we live just north of the border. Yeah. And uh, so your, your uh, Samaria might be, uh, you know, on the reservation. 
the Native American here in Montana. Uh, you know, this is an incredibly homogenous place where there's so few. I mean, everybody, basically, we're all just a bunch of old white people. And uh, anything else is, you know, uh, but that's, that's, that's kind of like your scenario, okay? Uh, and then, of course, for everybody, the, the last is the same. You know, the remotest parts of the earth. Okay? So your hometown, your home region, those that are nearby but different from you, and then anywhere and everywhere. Right? So we need to be witnesses in all those places. And, and no person can do all of them. It isn't like you're called. Not everybody's called to the mother's part. Not everybody's called to Samaria because somebody's got to stay in Jerusalem. And somebody's got to stay in Judea. Somebody's got to stay in the Bitter Valley. Somebody's got to stay in Montana. Uh, uh, but others, indeed, someone does need to go to the cross-cultural places, and others need to go to the craziest and most remotest parts of the earth. Uh, so that's the foundation. Turn to 2 Corinthians. And uh, in chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I really am glad at this point, at the time that it is, that I, I eliminated a few passages here because there's no way. Um, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia that in a great ordeal of affliction and their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. Wow. Wow. You know, I was talking with some people in Menifee, California, because Menifee, California, the, the Menifee Bible Church is our biggest supporter um, of, you know, a monthly support. They've actually kind of brought us on staff in some fashion to where they can run all of our taxes and so forth, and I'm, you know, a missionary pastor, and they, they uh, um, and that's just an amazing door that God opened as well. Uh, I met him through my IFCA and NICE connections, and, and, uh, uh, the great people of Menifee Bible Church. Uh, and uh, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> uh, oh, it was there when I first came to this position where, yikes, I really kind of go, got to go back and do this the old fashioned way. They support like any other missionary. I'm just not real comfortable with that. And, and one of the brothers there, who was, you know, just, just one, you know, one of the men, um, not leadership, any, I mean, just one of the faithful godly men of the church, said to me, and he said it kind of like, you know, Pastor Kelly, do not rob the rest of us of the opportunity to be to participate as a sender. Since you are the goer, the one who is sent, and the rest have to be the senders. And it was like, and it really it really helped me a lot. It was so bold and so direct, it was like, hey, don't do that. And then you know I I, I encounter passages like this. And, and this one blows me away. Because he talks in, you know, in verse 2 it says. They had affliction and an abundance of joy. That's amazing to start with. And in their deep poverty, they overflowed in liberal giving. Three says that he, te you know, I testify that they gave, not even, just even according to their ability, but above and beyond their ability. Where God then just really makes up the gap. You're not to be foolish, but you are to move in faith, trusting God. And, he, and they gave. And then verse 4 says, almost like maybe perhaps Paul was saying, that, no, man, you guys got enough to deal with here on your own. You know, you don't need to support us. Whether you 
They're begging it. And what is it? Verse 4. Begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in your support. Uh, awesome. So what I'm saying to you today is, is, is yes, I, I, I want you to consider all of this in light of our need and our mission. But beyond that, this is for your edification in terms of this is what the scriptures teach, and this is this is all of our responsibility before Almighty God concerning the kingdom. Okay? To be applied in general with anything in which God might uh, move. Look down at chapter just chapter 9 and uh, beginning of verse 6. He returns to this and says, You know, this I say. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We've all heard that, right? With giving and, and stewardship teachings and so forth. God loves a cheerful giver. It's exactly. You know, they were giving of their little joyfully and wanting to, and, and, and you know, as we looked in, 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 in chapter 8, and here's that principle. In verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Look at that. See, God's storehouses are endless. You know, as we kind of shovel out, God shovels in, and God has a bigger shovel. And uh, so. Meditate upon it. And as far as the scriptures are concerned, uh, lastly, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and beginning in verse 10. <clears throat> chapter 4 and verse 10. You know, this is a passage actually was the first passage I was given as a student in seminary to exegete, okay, to, to study, to take apart, to learn very precisely and specifically what does it say, and then to some extent, of course, you know, what, what does it not say. And, and it was very cool. Because typically we look at this, um, and particularly go down to... Um, verse 19. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Okay. And actually the, the, the assignment was based upon its context Who is being referenced in verse 19? Now, I've seen verse 19 on plaques. I've seen it hanging on people's walls. And it's awesome. The scripture is true. Context is everything. Okay? It's not the biblical thing of location, location, location. Because it's, 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 it's location. It's context. Uh, who is he talking about? Who is this promise given to so, let's go back to verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at least you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. So that I speak from what, not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And this is great. I, verse 12, I now, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. Most of us often think, well, how hard is it to learn how to live in prosperity? Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that a cinch? No. Not to do it godly, do it rightly. And to use those, 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 those resources unselfishly, etc. He's actually learned how to be content with being poor. And he's learned how to be content and live rightly with much. And that's so true as we stand before God. So he goes on saying, in every circumstance I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. 
I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in, your, in, in my affliction. The Philippians were one of his primary supporters. As Paul went out as a missionary church planter. Uh, and that's what he was, right? We speak of you know, Paul's missionary journeys. You know, it's usually how it's referred to. But he, he was a church planter. That's really all he did. He went to communities. He shared his faith. got a few converts. Stayed around a little bit to, 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 to teach and grow up a few leaders. Appointed elders. A lot of that. He moved on to the next town. And then he went back and revisited them. To see how they're doing and so forth. Okay? So, I mean, the Philippians were one of his chief supporters. So, um... And of course, his proclamation in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the very first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. So they were crucial. They were key people in his life. For even in Thessalonica, he sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. Because see, God's going to do what God's going to do. The question is, is He going to do it through you? Uh, God's going to do what God is going to do. The question is, is He going to do it through me? So, so Paul, Paul really is in need. But you know, he says in verse 11, not that I speak from what, because he knows that God's going to come through. He says... In verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself, because he knows, but, but he, he is in reality, he, he, he can't just go with nothing, can he? It's just impossible. But he sees it as a given because God is his sender and giver. But he says to them, I seek the profit which increases to your account. But I, verse 18, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance and I am amply supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, fragrance, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. And my God, and here we come to verse 19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So who is this promise given to in verse 19? See, if we take it out of context, we can just say, hey. Because I'm a Christian, God's going to supply every need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. No. Most every promise of God is conditional other than salvation itself. And he says, so who is it? Who is he talking to? He's talking not even so much as to individuals. See, normally we think, but this might apply to my, myself and my family. This, first and foremost, this applies to the church that support, and it's people, that support missionaries. That's the context. You, you support me, you support, Paul says you support, you as a church support the missionary cause. And, and because of that, verse 19 is a promise to you. And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So when I was given this task some 25 years ago uh, in seminary, um, that's what I concluded, and that's what I presented, and and uh, and, and that pleased my professor <laughs> because he agreed with that. That yes, it's not the, it's not a an unconditional promise to every individual. It's a conditional promise to the church that supports the missionary cause. Jesus Community Church. I really do look back at my time here and feel that I kind of always felt somewhat that. We need to do more in that regard. We need to do more in that regard. We did a lot of home missions, and, and it still kind of is. I mean, I'm a home mission. Um, and uh, then we, you know, we, we, we support uh, you know, T.J. Van de Hay, and many of you do individually, and, 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 and uh, the kidders in and, and Belize. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we've you know, extended and, and broadened our horizons there. For one thing, we support people in places around the world. It just really keeps us centered. Uh, that you see and you understand, if, if, if even just the fact that most of the world does not have it like we do. You know, we live only about an hour from Tecate, Mexico. And I met with my son-in-law, who's now in Linden, Washington. And he and one of their church elders 
flew to San Diego, I picked them up, we went to Ducati to a mission they support. And I am now going to be becoming, because they lost their San Diego contact, because it's a mission of, of Northeast Washington churches, three churches there. But they want a local San Diego contact. So Church of Calvary Hill, that's what we're calling our church plan, Church of Calvary Hill, um, we, we already have uh, a, an international mission to be the, the, the San Diego contact of that well-established and long-term mission that they have there. And, and it goes to several communities in that northern part of, uh, of, of, of Baja, Mexico. I saw Ducati what I did not expect to see. I've been to a lot of places in Mexico. And it was horrific, horrific conditions that tens of thousands of people were living in. And we went from church to church, from town to town, and we saw the amazing things that God was doing, we saw the amazing need. And uh, if anything, uh, it keeps us aware of, you know, the, the Christian life is not like a lot of those televangelists want to tell you. You know, it's all about, you know, you're a child of the king, and, and you're just going to have it made, live in a beautiful house, drive a beautiful car. What's that got to do with anything? I mean, I have to admit, I like those things. If I have the opportunity to have them, I, you know, I probably would. You know, I have. <laughs> I have. Um, I, mean, I, live now, I used to live in that big giant house and drive this little Mercedes sports car, even though it's ancient and falling apart. But um, it looks cool still. And it still <laughs> drives for it, still drives for it too. It's got to hold it together. Uh, but what's that got to do with the big picture of life and death and eternity? And so... You know, we, we look at our teenagers who want every little cool thing with their clothing or whatever. Take a trip to Mexico. It's like, wow. They don't even have shoes, let alone the ones I want. I'm not content with the perfectly good ones I've got. On, etc., etc., right? So, uh, but, uh, so I present this to you, and, uh, what God did in the assurance that Almighty God has called us there, uh, where we're at right now, and we are at a really cool point. Because in a sense, even though we've been gone a year, um, our there's you know all the background of meeting people took place during all that time. The church plant, in terms of taking any tangible step forward, really only began just a few weeks ago when we began our first Sunday evening meeting in our home. Um, and we have three families and counting. And I, I expect when we get back, uh, the players and uh, uh, the, the, the family, I can never remember the last name, uh, friends of, uh, of the Andersons, uh, and then, you know, my, my surfer dude buddy that owns this surfing clothing shop called Glazed Over. <laughs> uh. Yeah, get Glazed Over, right? <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 I'm, I'm real hopeful he's going to be joining us soon as well. And, and uh, so we're right at that cusp. It's very, very exciting. And, and, and again, we know um, that Almighty God is going to do what, he, what, what He's going to do in our life. And I know for one thing, He's testing our resolve. He is once again refining our faith. Because um, we're here, and um, we're there, and we've gone by His provision, and he, he, if He wants to keep us there, then, uh, then He will. We invite you, I encourage you, I, I really even plead with you, that you would uh, you consider your part, individually and as the elders and as a church, uh, to, to kind of come back to where we really probably should have started in the first place, is to really understand the relationship as the sending body and the people who would have a tangible, real support to enable us to go in Jesus' name as a uh, you know, sister, daughter, church plant of Jesus Community Church, Montana, to reach out uh, to a very needy place with a lot of lost people uh, in the great city of San Diego. So rather than me normally as I might close in prayer, Glenn, would you come up and just um, praise the Lord least concerning, uh, you know, let, you know, He is your pastor. Uh, and it was really neat to see. Because one thing too as far as 
knowing for certain what God wants to do. If I could go on for another hour speaking about all the things that God was doing over the last two or three years to bring Glenn in as one of our elders to just seamlessly as I go, he steps in. Do you realize how good Jesus Community Church has had it over its entire history? Three pastors in 30 years. Actually, it was two pastors in, in 29 years, so you really lowered the average. <laughs> Rex Appleberry, Dennis's brother, um, you know, founded this church in 1983. He also, you know, was not like, just kind of decided he wanted to leave or was put out like so many pastors are or something, right? He died suddenly as a beloved pastor. God called him home and the church loved him and wanted him to stay. Um, you know, same thing here. We left in a lot of anguish. We, but I could want, at one point never envision leaving here. But when God called, it just made it easier to get over the emotions of leaving because we were certain of God's calling and the excitement that that brings. And, uh, and so we left. And then it was a pretty seamless, it was a pretty easy transition, even between his sudden loss of a pastor, how quickly and how miraculously God brought me here in, in, in the aftermath of Rex's death. And then this one. So 30 years. Uh, and, you know, we have churches in the neighborhood that in the last 30 years have probably had at least 10 because they kind of have a pastor about every three years. Uh, and usually not, it's usually they're booted out every three years. There's a great spirit here, and uh, I love this place, and you will always be my spiritual children, even if some of you are like my mother. <laughs> You stop one verse short. Yeah. I want to share one more verse here. Going back to 2 Corinthians. Um, you stopped in verse 4, and I want to read verse 5. It says, And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. See, everybody wants your money. Everybody wants your money. People that sell nonstick bakeware want your money. <laughs> People sell things that you're never going to use want your money. And we're all too eager to give them our money. But see, we, we need to understand first, we give ourselves to the will of God. We need to understand it's not our money, it's His money. We're stewards. One day we give an account for that money. We give an account for everything we did with it. And then by His will we give unto others. And, you know, the, the need has been laid before the church. Um, you know, the church as a whole will take up this matter, but you as individuals also need to take up this matter. We have a, a brother and sister in Christ that have gone out and established a work. They need help. So, I am going to ask you Lay this before the, the throne of God. Seriously consider, do I need this new boat angle? Do I need this new doodad? And I do without those and, and commit some of the resources that I have to, to the work of furthering the kingdom of God. Amen?